going to be talking today about a topic that is pretty, pretty common. Uh, if you read journals, we see more and more studies being done um, that are retrospective reviews of medical records. Um, it sort of seems like this ought to be pretty easy to do, and who's going first? And Andrew's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the pitfalls involved in doing these, and um, and then after he's talked to you, we're going to have you divide up into six groups. So three groups? You don't think we should do two of each? No? Six groups of three? Six groups of three, and and every every pair of groups will get one of the three papers, and you'll go through a checklist and um, see whether or not it's a reasonable uh, medical record review, and then we'll break up and we'll come back afterwards for a discussion. <coughs> so no one will sit at this seat. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew Meltzer. So yeah, chart reviews are common. The idea here is that. Let's have rigor to our chart reviews. Let's decrease the bias. Just like we would do a normal randomized control trial, we want to use the, thank you, the same sort of structure with the chart reviews. We're not just going through the charts and pulling out the data, but we're using sort of standard methodology to make it more like research as opposed to just sort of reading through our charts. The nice thing about these kind of studies is that like the, to go from zero to like the best chart review ever is like super easy. Like literally, you can listen to what we talk about through this hour, and you can be as good as any chart review researcher in the world because the the design is basically really well established of how we can do this, and uh, anybody can do it. To me, it's like I'm not a great cook, and to be a great cook seems incredibly complicated, but I like to make cocktails, and it's super easy to do that, and you can make a good martini with basically three ingredients and as good as anybody in the world, and to me, that's sort of the chart review. So once you learn how to do it, um, it's a pretty easy thing to do. So. Uh, We'll go through the three papers, the only three papers you really need to know about how to do the chart reviews um, to get published in emergency medicine high quality journals and uh, I'll discuss those now and hopefully have low level bias. <laughs> so this is us. Um, these happen all the time. I mean, I feel like our IRB is just overwhelmed with crappy chart reviews that come from residents and come from fellows and you know everybody's just sort of throwing out chart reviews. Um, it's easy to do it. Let's do a retrospective, the data's there. And, um, but, you know, you got to do it well, otherwise you're just sort of wasting everyone's time. I know early in my career I probably had med students spend a summer just going through charts and we spent all this time and then the product was not great because I didn't design it and set it up in the proper way. Now I think I know how to do it properly and uh, you know you're going to lead to a product that's actually going to be a paper. Um, it can be incredibly time consuming. I sort of feel like Hopefully we're not giving this lecture in five years because the fact that we're still having to go through charts just means that our EHRs are still basically not good enough to just pull the data automatically, but that's the world we live in and uh, I don't see chart reviews going away, at least not this year, next year, uh, but maybe someday. So 25% um, of all of our scientific studies in emergency medicine are chart reviews. And as I said, the EHRs are not made for research. So this is sort of the granddaddy of the methodology papers. It's been cited more than a thousand times. And uh, it came out about 25 years ago. I still cite it. It's by these two guys, well, five people. Gilbert and Lowenstein is usually who gets quoted. Um, and people often refer to their methodology of how to do the chart review. Uh, basically, they looked through the, char the charts of emergency medicine papers and said, okay, let's describe those methods. Let's come up with an established sort of criteria of what the uh, high quality characteristics are for a chart review. And these are the eight characteristics. So I don't need to read them all, but basically you look through this paper and you can see how to do a high quality chart review. And um, there's essentially eight components within it and um, refers to training. So you basically, if you have your med student abstractor or your research assistant, they need to be trained on how to do it. That seems sort of obvious. Case selection, that needs to be well-defined, just like if you were doing a clinical trial on RCT, you need to have clear inclusion, exclusion criteria. You need to establish that beforehand. Um, definition of variables, just like with a, you know, a clinical trial, you have to have your case report forms, and you have to have really know exactly what you're gonna take. You can't just say, we're gonna look at hypertensive medication and try to see which is better. You gotta really decide, what are the outcomes that I really care about? You gotta have clear abstraction forms, so you gotta have structured data sheets, so basically, Anybody can 
pull this out and do it, and you don't have a lot of variability between the uh, abstractors. You have to have meetings and monitoring. Ideally, this is the one that I usually fail on, is blinding. So the person who's doing the chart abstraction is not supposed to know what the study's about. Um, to me, that's really hard to do because usually the people doing it are sort of interested in research and want to be involved. And uh, unless they're just totally paid and you know they're not med students, they're not undergraduates, um, I, I usually feel like you sort of have to tell them like what we're doing, but and that usually obviously can lead to some bias. The idea is that all of these things can decrease bias because if you're trying to look for does one medication is it better than another or is one thing associated with something else, um, if you have your pre-specified hypothesis, um, then you can have bias and have outcomes that maybe are not true to reality. And then finally, the testing of inter-rater reliability. Uh, you'll see some statistics in there. The common one used is the kappa statistic, which is inter-observer agreement. Um, it's pretty easy to do. You don't have to do it on every single one, but basically the idea is that on some of your charts, not just one abstractor, but two abstractors go through it, and then you just make sure they get the same answers. And uh, it's not that hard to calculate the kappa coefficient. You can Google how to do it, uh, but it's pretty easy, and you want to get it basically as close to perfect as possible. And if you <laughs> see a lot of variability, it's often because um, there's, you know, maybe your definitions are bad or maybe it's just not clear in the chart. Often this comes when you're doing like radiology type studies when they're going through sort of the paragraph written by the radiologist and uh, maybe a novice is trying to pull out what's important and there's just a lot of variability there. So all of these things are sort of the big eight from the uh, Gilbert Lowenstein study. I always want to say Gilbert and Sullivan, but Gilbert Lowenstein. Um, about 10 years later, Wooster said, all right, if eight is good, 12 is better. She, um, Wooster, Andrew Wooster, or Worcester, added four more to this big list. And now often people quote this Worcester study. You can see the four more. These are the first eight that were in the first Gilbert and Lowenstein. And then basically they added four more. I mean, I think these are all pretty sort of obvious stuff, some of these things. So institutional review board. What are you going to do with missing data? This gets a little more complicated, so maybe you want to start thinking ahead about working with your statistician about how do you work with missing data. And there's a lot of different ways to deal with missing data. Sampling methods, so that goes to how you're finding your patients. Um, often we're doing ICD-10 EHR searches, but there's different ways to go about finding your patients. And uh, it sort of goes also to nine, medical record identified. If you're different ways to sample, potentially can lead to, to bias also. And this is, so that's the Worcester study. And then finally, so those are the first two. I know you're excited for the third one. This is the Amy Kaji study in 2014, where basically went back through all those 12 elements and said, okay, let's look at the pitfalls and let's look at some of the solutions. So again, if you read these three articles, you're sort of as good an expert as anybody in the world on how to do an emergency medicine chart review. And that's what we're gonna practice over the next half hour. So, uh, and she basically talked about some pitfalls and solutions. So sometimes just chart review is just not a good design choice just because you can't get the, the data you want. Um, sometimes there is investigator conflict of interest. Sometimes the sample doesn't represent reality. Sometimes the data conflicts, poor and consistent training, and a percent check for liability and missing data. So you can see she also listed possible solutions. Um, one thing to think about is having a flow diagram, like a consort diagram, just like you'd see in a regular um, sort of clinical trial where you're starting with your you know, larger sample and you go down to your inclusion, exclusion, and then follow through to the, the groups that you're comparing at the end. Um, I think all this requires regular meetings and training. Uh, you really have to be close to your data. You really just can't give this to a, a student or an assistant. You really have to be following up on it and making sure that there's not missing stuff, that everything is consistent. And uh, that just requires just sort of being a good PI and just being like involved and present uh, with your data. And I don't think there's any way to get around that. So I will now turn it over uh, to Dr. Easton, I believe. Thank you. Thanks. OK, so the next part, we're going to do some exercise on looking at a couple of articles <laughs> that we feel, I don't want to give it away, but may have some areas for improvement. And um, we're going to have you guys kind of grade each one um, in groups. And then at the end, we're going to go over, OK, how could these articles have done a little better in their methodology? So if we can three, try to three people for each table. Okay, have tables of four people and um, we're gonna work together to look through these articles. There's so a lot of space down here. I mean a lot of space. <laughs> so the oxygen is higher, you can think better. 